Hello, this is Leroy Meadows, and I want to thank you for joining me today. In this session, we're going to start talking about Chapter 17, which is Process Costing. Now, because the material is so weighty in this chapter and there's so much information, we're going to break this up into multiple videos, at least four, potentially five. So I just wanted to let you know that so we can go ahead and go through these and just take little bite-sized portions uh, so we don't feel like we're getting overwhelmed with all the information here in the chapter. Uh, on at least this video and maybe a couple of the other ones, I will be doing a little bit of illustration here and going back to Excel so that we can take a look at some of this uh, and, and break this down and really start to comprehend this. Because this is a really heavy chapter, I want to make sure we take it slowly. So let's go ahead and get started here. What are we going to cover in this chapter? Well, we're going to talk about situations in which process costing systems are appropriate, and we're going to compare this and compare process costing to job costing. We're then going to understand the basic concepts of process costing and compute average unit costs. We're going to describe the five steps in process costing and calculate equivalent units. We're going to use the weighted average method and the first in first out method of process costing. We're going to apply process costing methods to situations with transferred in costs and understand the need for hybrid costing systems such as operation costing, uh, which is actually a hybrid of job costing and process costing. So let's go ahead and get started here. First of all, in order to un understand process costing, let's compare it to job costing. Now we did this in chapter four. Uh, so job costing systems, remember when we're making units, when we're making products, they're distinct identifi identifiable units of a product or service. It can be one unit, it can be a group of individual units, but they're distinguished between uh, each job. Each job is going to uh, consume a different amount of resources. So examples of this are custom-made machines, houses, things like that. Things that we custom make, maybe boats on the higher end of things. So different things that we custom make or we make for each person a little bit different. Process costing is mass production, whereas in job costing, we're making things more customizable, more distinguished between and distinct between different uh, for different customers. Process costing is mass production, really. Masses of identical or similar products, uh, similar units of a product or service, such as food. When we think about food, we think about what? Uh, ketchup, uh, soda. Um, a number of different things. Chemical processing, that will happen as well in process costing, and, and that's what we use for process costing, rather. Um, so process costing is really a system where the unit cost of a product or service is obtained by getting total costs and assigning those costs to many identical or similar units of output. In our ketchup example, if I'm making ketchup, I need what? I need tomatoes, I need salt, I need water, I need a bunch of things. And I'm and when we're going to make this stuff up, we're going to make a lot of ketchup, and we're assuming that each bottle of ketchup is going to consume the same amount of resources, the same proportionality of tomatoes and salt, water, and so forth. We're going to take the total cost of all that, not only the direct materials, but labor and, and uh, overhead, we're going to come add up all those and we're going to spread those out evenly over the number of units of output from the production process. And that's because each unit is going to receive the same or very similar amounts of direct material costs, direct manufacturing labor, and indirect manufacturing costs. So let's take about uh, take another look at job costing versus process costing. So let's just examine this a little bit more. In a job costing system, individual jobs use a di uses different quantities of resources. So it really would be incorrect to cost each job at the same average production. Think about building a house. If we build a house, if a 5,000 square foot house versus a 2,000 square foot house, is it going to require the same amount of resources in a 5,000 square foot house as it would in a 2,000 square foot house? No. In a 5,000 square foot house, the house is going to be larger. It's going to require more lumber, probably more windows, more shingles for the roof, 
um, more doors maybe, bigger garage. A lot of things are going to be different, a different amount of uh, flooring, different costs with associated with uh, drywall and so forth. It's going to be more costs involved, more consumption of resources in creating a 5,000 square foot house than we would think in a 2,000 square foot house. So, so since they're doing using a different quantity of resources, it really would be incorrect to cost each job at the same average production cost. In contrast, when identical or similar units of products or services are mass produced, process costing is used to calculate an average production cost for all units produced. So the main difference between process costing and job costing is the extent of averaging used to compute the unit of product costs or services. For example, what we mean is, what we're talking about with the extent. We're talking about the extent. Let's say I have a job and I am making, and this one customer asked me to make 30 different desks customized to their specifications. Well, I'm going to take the materials, the cost of wood, the cost of labor, and cost of overhead. I'm going to compute that on a per job basis on that job basis but then I'm going to average out between uh, all and take the total cost of that job and spread that out over all the tables I'm making but that's one job another job may ask me to make d uh, one big table a conference table unique and custom to its own specifications so in one situation with that cut with the conference table I have one price one no, of making that job whereas that earlier job where i'm making multiple tables i am averaging it out to an extent in process costing i'm actually taking all my costs of everything i make and i'm equally distributing them to every unit produced so that's what we talk about when the extent of averaging is used to compute unit cost of products or services that's what we're talking about here so Let's take a look at product costing cost categories. We're generally going to have two different cost categories, direct materials and conversion costs. Now we're looking at the first department here. The first department, direct materials, are going to be added at the beginning of the production process. And then in subsequent departments, somewhere either at the beginning of the process or it could be at the very end of the process or it could be somewhere in between. In the first department, we're going to add all the materials because with no materials, we have nothing with which to convert into a finished good or into a unit of output. The second cost classification we're going to have or second cost category we're going to have is conversion costs. And this is simply the cost of direct labor and manufacturing overhead added together. If we remember our distinction uh, between prime and uh, conversion costs before, prime costs were direct materials and direct labor. Conversion costs were direct labor and manufacturing overhead. In this case, for process costing, we're going to take our direct materials, have its own cost category, and then the other cost category is going to be conversion costs. Why? Because direct materials are usually added at a specific point in the production process where conversion costs are going to be generally added equally along the production process. So it's the timing of incurrence. We want to separate each timing of incurrence uh, separate. Usually in conversion costs, we're going to list direct labor and combine that in with manufacturing overhead because we're assuming in most situations that labor costs are going to be incurred to run the machines all the way throughout the conversion process. If there is a specific instance where direct labor is inputted and it only is incurred at one specific point in the process, then we will have a category for labor costs. Another situation where we could have direct materials is if we have direct material where we have multi uh, more than two cost uh, cost categories is if we have different direct materials that are added at different points in time. Um, for example, we maybe we have direct material one. Let's say I, making ice cream, we may have certain direct materials added at the very beginning, the milk, the sugar, and so forth. Maybe something has to be mixed up. 
and then maybe we're adding in other flavor other other stuff like maybe little bits of cherry or strawberry or whatever little uh, little bits of chocolate in the process later in that case we would have multiple direct material categories and and uh we'll see that frequently where we have multiple direct material categories However, with conversion costs, we are generally going to have just one cost category for that. So while we generally, in, in our situations, we only have two cost categories, we can have different uh, total number of cost categories if we have multiple direct materials added at different times in the process. And then we'll combine usually conversion costs. Uh, so we'll combine usually labor with manufacturing overhead. Now let's take a look at three scenarios. And this is really going to be most of the rest of this chapter here where we get through three scenarios here. The first scenario is going to be no beginning or ending work in process inventory. No beginning work in process inventory, but we have some ending work in process inventory. And then we're going to have both beginning and ending work in process inventories. And, and uh, so we're going to take a look at all three of those cases here. Now, let's take a look at process costing. Case one or scenario one, no beginning or ending inventories uh, for work in process. In this case, if I have no beginning inventories and I have no ending inventory for work in process, what does that mean? That means that everything I started, I completed and transferred to finished goods. So all my output units are complete. So in this case, I just take my total costs and divide it by my total output. I do not have to worry about putting a value on ending work in process inventory because I have none. I don't have to worry about you know adding costs from beginning inventory because I have none. So this is pretty much the easiest situation here. And we might see this in banking and stuff like that when we're using process costing to process checks or to process or to uh, or to process certain uh, features, functions uh, within a bank um, where everything that comes in, we're done for that day. So there's no ending work and process inventory, uh, maybe from a service sector. Um, and we may have some of that in manufacturing as well. But there are some cases where we'll ne we, we, we should not have beginning inventory or ending work in process inventory. So in that case where we have no beginning, ending work in process inventory, we just take our total costs and divide it by the total number of output units. Now let's take a look at process costing case two and here's where we're going to really slow down just a little bit here we're going to first of all summarize the flow of physical output units in uh, where we have no beginning inventory but we do have some ending work and process inventory so the first step is to summarize the flow of physical units of output we're going to compute output in terms of equivalent units we're going to summarize the total cost to account for we're going to compute the cost per equivalent unit and then assign total cost to units completed and to units in ending work and process inventory. So let's talk about equivalent units. Or let's talk about, first of all, summarize the flow of physical units. No beginning inventory. What we do have is units started. So we add some work if we have no beginning inventory. But in this period, we start working on units. So we have to figure out how many units to account for. Let's say I have zero beginning inventory. I start producing 500 units. I have to account for 500 units altogether. My beginning inventory is zero plus what I started throughout the period. Then I'm going to summarize that by figuring out how much of those units were completed and transferred out to the next department. And let's say 400 units were transferred out to the next department. If I have to account for 500 units, 400 of them were completed, how many does that leave in ending work and process inventory of units that were not completed? 100 units. So I'm simply, simply going to summarize the flow of physical units of output. Then we're going to compute output in terms of equivalent units. 
So that is the focus here of this next section. Now, what is uh, equivalent units? Equivalent units are simple, and these and this is for ending work and process inventory. This and the well, the purpose of it is for calculating work and process inventory at the end of the period. However, the uh, equivalent units will be applicable to fully completed units as well, fully completed output units as well. So we're going to take the quantity of each input and units completed and unfish, unfinished units of work in process, and then we're going to convert the quantity of input into the amount of completed output and units that could be produced with that quantity of input. For example, let's say that I have uh, six half-made t-shirts. All these, and I know this is kind of, you know, out there, but just, uh, and it's not really going to happen, but just for conceptual purchases or purposes, let's think, let's imagine that we have half, th uh, six half-made t-shirts, all on the right side. If we have all right half portions of the t-shirt and we have not made the left-hand section yet, I'm going to take those six partially completed t-shirts and restate that as how many completed t-shirts could I have? And what is equivalent to? Well, if I have six half-made t-shirts, that's the equivalent in numeric terms, not in actual terms of full shirts, because I have six half-made t-shirts, but it's the equivalent of three fully made t-shirts. That is the concept of equivalent units, and we're actually going to look at this here in just a moment. So let's take a look here. In fact, let's go now to uh, working uh, and getting some examples here. Let's take a look at beginning units in inventory. Let's say I have no beginning units of inventory. I start 800 units in the period. So how many units do I have to account for? I have to account for 800 units. And let's say I transferred out 600 of those units. How many units in ending inventory do I have? If I need to account for 800, 600 of them are transferred out. That means I have to have 200 units in ending inventory. So how many units have I accounted for? I've accounted for all 800. So now if those units of ending inventory, 600 units, they're complete. They have all the direct materials and they're fully converted. So let's put this over here into a, a, a production report here, at least the first step of a production report. I have no beginning inventory. I started 800 units. So my units to account for were 800. Now, if I completed and transferred, you know, why did that not take? There we go. So if I completed and transferred out 600 units, then what are my, what's my ending work in process? 200 units. And how much should I account for? My 600 have completed and transferred out units plus my ending work in process. So now I've accounted for all 800 units. I had to determine how many units to account for and now I've accounted for all those units. Now, let's focus in on equivalent units. Let's say that the material percentage of completion of the materials is, well, let's first of all look here. Do my completed and transferred out units have all the direct materials? Well, yes, by definition, if they're completed and transferred out, they're fully complete with respect to direct materials and conversion costs. So I'm just going to carry that over. They're 100% complete. Now let's take a work, look at the ending work and process inventory. 
Let's say that the percentage of completion of direct materials, yeah, let's say direct materials are added at the beginning of the process. So they're at the beginning of the process, and let's say then that we're about 65% complete with respect to conversion costs. If, and let's, let's take a look at a timeline here, and let me go create a timeline here. And this is what? This is 0% complete. And actually, let's make this round number. 60% complete. And this is going to be 100% complete. If I add in my direct materials at the very beginning of the process, I'm going to add in my direct materials here. If I'm over here, uh, and this represents, this end of the timeline here represents um, units completed. Now, somewhere down the line here, 50, 60% is where we're at the end of the period. Let's say at the end of the period, we make an estimation that our work in process is 60%. So let's put that here. I am going to figure how how much of my direct materials have been added? How much in conversion costs have I been have I experienced? So my direct materials are added here at the very beginning of the process, and if they're all added at one time, my work in process, even though they're not fully converted, they have all of their direct materials added. So we're going to go ahead here and say they're a hundred percent complete with respect to direct materials. So my ending work in process, I have 200 units. All the materials already been added. So we have 200 equivalent units of work in process for direct materials. Now, let's take a look at my ending work in process for conversion costs. Let's go back to my timeline here. And I've only, I'm only 60% complete. At the end of the period, at the end of the month, I'm only 60% complete. So what I'm going to do is take that 200 units and multiply them by 0 0.60 to get my equivalent units or the equivalent units of work completed. So I'm going to take my 200 units and multiply that by 60% complete. So in essence, for the incursion of conver uh, conversion costs, my ending work in process, if I restate that 60% completed, though 200 units that are partially completed, restate that in terms of fully completed units. Well, in essence, or for computational purposes, I have 120 complete uh, units in, as far as conversion costs. Are they really complete? No. But we need to restate that so we can figure out how much we're going to assign of cost to each unit. So what are my total equivalent units of production? My total equivalent of production for direct materials is going to be the 
amount of materials I've added to the 600 units completed and transferred out, plus the equivalent units of 200 uh, units for direct materials, which would be 800. Because remember, I've got to spread my cost out at the uh, somewhere down the line. I've got to spread my cost out over all units that have direct materials, not just the materials I've already transferred out and I've already completed, but I have to spread the cost of materials on the ending work and process inventory as well. Same thing with conversion costs. I have to take my conversion costs, whatever that conversion costs are, and not only spread it out over units that have com been completed and transferred out, but I also have to com uh, spread those costs out over costs incurred in ending working process inventory. So that's where I'm getting my equivalent units. So now, the total amount of work done in that current period only for my direct materials cost category is 800 units. For conversion costs, it is going to be, uh, my conversion cost category is going to be 720 units. So let's take a look here. And let's go back to our PowerPoint here. Now we're calculating these equivalent units separately for each input unit. And when we're calculating equivalent units to step two, we're going to focus on the quantities and disregard the dollar amounts until after equivalent units are computed. So we just want to look at equivalent units in terms of units, of output units. So let's take a look here. In our example, in the book here for the assembly department, we have no beginning inventory. We started work for 400 units throughout the period. So the total units we have to account for, 400. During the period, we transferred out 175 units, which means that ending work and process has to be 225 units. Now, out of that 225 units, those units already have all of their direct materials because it was added in the beginning of the process. So by definition, if we added all the direct materials at the beginning of the process, they have to have all their direct materials. There's nothing left to add. So they are fully complete or 100% complete with respect to direct materials. However, when we look at the cost category of conversion costs, and remember that's direct labor and manufacturing overhead, we're only 60% of the way throughout the process. So we're going to take that 225 units and multiply that by 0 0.60 or 60% to get the equivalent units of 135. Then we focus on getting work done in the current period only. For direct materials, I have a total of 400 equivalent units and 310 for a conversion cost category. Again, taking my completed and transferred out units and adding that to the equivalent units of ending work and process inventory. So let's take a look here and practice uh, doing some uh, uh, calculation of equivalent units of production. Let's go over here, and we're going to look at four different or three different scenarios. Let's take a look at and let's figure out how many units, and let's come up with some numbers here. So we have no units of beginning inventory. We have 1,800 units started throughout the period. So how many units do we have to account for? 1,800. Units completed and transferred out, let's say we did 1,350 units transferred out. So how many units are left in ending inventory? 450. And so let's go ahead and do that. And now we're going to 
And first of all, before I get into these scenarios, let's take a look and let's just see what we can do here. If we're solving for a problem, let's say the problem gives us three bits of information. Uh, let's say it gives us, uh, let's see. Let's say that the um, problem says that we have no units of beginning inventory. We started the period, uh, we units started during the period 1800, and we had 350 units in ending inventory. How many units were completed and transferred out? We can use this formula here. Um, let's see, units in beginning inventory plus units started equals units completed plus units in ending inventory. And I can just use this formula. And if I do this, and let's just go ahead and do that. Units in beginning inventory, zero, plus units started, which is 1,800, is going to be equal to uh, my variable, which I'm not going to know. And let me space that out here a little bit. Plus 350. And what I can do is just isolate the variable here by subtracting 350 from both sides. And how much will that get me? That will get me 1,400 equals x. So we're pretty much just using a little bit of algebra here to solve for this. So that's where this formula will come in handy for you. Units in beginning inventory plus units started equals units complete plus units in ending inventory. So we can solve for that as well if we're not given the appropriate information. So, so let's go back here to our original assumptions. And so we have here, now when we compute units uh, or, uh, of equivalent production or total equivalent units, we're looking at units completed and transferred out plus units and in ending inventory. So let's take a look at scenario one. So our focus here, in fact, I'm going to highlight this so we know where our focus is going to be on. And our focus is going to be on this set of data right here. Now, let's take a look at materials first. So let's just look at direct materials, cost category, and then we'll look at conversion costs here in just a moment. Conversion cost, or for material costs, units completed and transferred out. We had 1,450 units transferred out. By definition, if they're completed, they have all the materials. So 1,450. And let's see, let's say that and materials are at the beginning of the process, conversion is 60% complete. So here is where we have to look at the scenario for ending inventory. We have to know what's going on in order to, to put a total equivalent units for each cost category uh, so we can calculate that total uh, to that uh, equivalent units in ending inventory. So my units in ending inventory, 350. Now, if we go back to our timeline, they're added at the beginning here. So by definition, if these units are started, then they, if these units are started here, then they have their direct materials because we can't start working on the process until we have those direct materials. So they're 100% complete. So... If, uh, so we have equivalent units in ending inventory of uh, 350. So my total equivalent units for direct materials under scenario one, 1800. Now let's take a look at uh, conversion costs. Conversion costs, units completed and transferred out, 1450. 
And because they're transferred out, we know they have all their conversion costs. And then, what about units in ending inventory? Well, we have 350 units in ending inventory, and they're only 60% complete. So I'm going to take my 350 units in ending inventory, multiply that by 0.6, and that will give me 210 units of conversion costs in ending inventory. So my equivalent units of production for conversion costs is going to be 1,600. Now, before we do the next two, you may be asking, why in the world do I care about computing equivalent units of, for either materials or conversion costs? Because we're going to take those total costs, we're going to take those costs, uh, total under the weighted average method, current costs only under the first in first out method, and we're going to apply that and divide that by total equivalent units of production to get a cost per equivalent unit. That cost per equivalent unit is then going to help us to value the amount of inventory transferred out to the next department, and plus it's going to help us to value ending inventory. So this is why this type of computation is important. So let's take a look at the next scenario. Materials are at the beginning of the process. Conversion is 30% complete. So let's take a look at our direct materials, completed and transferred out. Well, we have all the materials uh, because those materials transferred out, those units are transferred out. They have all the materials. Now, what about in ending inventory? Well, we have 350 units in ending inventory. Materials are at the beginning of the process, so they have all so we have all 350 units here. So what are my uh, equivalent units of production for direct materials? Simply my 1450 plus my 350 gives me 1800. Now let's look at conversion costs. My conversion cost for completed and transferred out units, my equivalent units, are 1450. And then we have what? 350 units in ending inventory. And they are what? 30% uh, complete. So I'm going to take that 350 and multiply that by the degree of completion of 0.30. I now have equivalent units of, of conversion costs in ending inventory of 105. So my total equivalent units for conversion costs is going to be the sum total of both, the amount of units transferred out and the con conversion cost in ending inventory of 105 for 1555. Now let's take a look at scenario three. Scenario three is going to give us a little bit, uh, a little bit more complicated here, because in this situation, materials are added halfway, uh, are added halfway throughout the process, and conversion is fifty-five percent complete. So let's take a look here and see where on the timeline uh, the drug materials are not added here; they are added here. And let's put this up here. And let's see. Drip materials added here. Now, with this scenario, um, let's get this fixed here. This is where I'm adding my direct materials, halfway throughout the process here. But how far along in the conversion process am I? Because if I'm only 20% in the conversion process right here, then have my materials been added yet? No. So in that case, we would have zero equivalent units in ending inventory if, my mater if we were only 20% of the way through. What about 40% of the way through? 
if materials are at the 50% of the, of the uh, at the 50% completion point, and we're only right here, are we there yet? No, we're not, because we're right here. But we're 55% complete, so we're kind of halfway between here and here. So we're we're at this point here where you see my cursor going up and down. This is where we're at at the end of the period. We're about 55% complete. Have my materials been added? Yes, they are, because we're further along. We've already added the materials here, and we're actually further along in the process. So he, in, the, in this situation here, my direct materials completed and transferred out, 1450, and my ending working process is also 350. Because the materials have been added, because they're added halfway throughout the process, and we're in our and through the conversion process, we're past the halfway point. So now let's take a look at conversion costs. Conversion costs completed and transferred out units, 1450. 350 units are 55% complete. So We have a 90, 192 and a half. We'll actually round that up to 193. And then, so our units will be what? Total units of 1,643. Now, now let's look at scenario four. And I did go ahead and add scenario four on here. Materials are added at the end of the process conversion is 60% complete. So for the direct for units for direct materials completed and transferred out, they have all of their materials. What are the equivalent units of for direct materials and ending inventory? Well, we're 60% through the process, but the materials have yet to be added. We have not added those yet, so we would have a zero here to represent materials that we have not added out. So, my total equivalent units for direct materials, 1450. Because even though we have 350 units up here, the materials have not been added yet because they're added at the end of the process and we're only 60% of the way through the process. Now let's take a look at conversion costs, where you have 1450 units completed and transferred out Conversion cost in ending inventory is what? 350 times 0.6 of 210. So my total equivalent units for conversion costs are 1,660 units. So here, are, here is an example or an exercise that we did uh, in the session here that are that will help us get practice with computing equivalent units of production. Now let's take a look here and figure out what we're doing here. Remember this case, and just to refresh our memory, in no beginning inventory, but we do have some ending work in process inventory. In this case, where there's no beginning inventory, we're just going to take our total cost added for the month right here, and let me pull this up here, total cost added for the month, divide that by the equivalent units of work done in the current period, which we computed right here, our total equivalent units. We're going to take our total cost, divide that by the equivalent units to get a cost per equivalent unit. We can now then value and put a dollar amount on the completed and transferred out units, 175. How do I get, so how do I compute that? I'm going to take my completed units of 175 for direct materials times my direct materials cost per equivalent unit and then add to that the 175 units transferred out times the cost of uh, per equivalent unit for conversion costs. So when I add those together, I'm going to get 24,500. I've now put a value on the completed and transferred out unit. So then I can debit the next work in process uh, account and credit the current work in process account because those, those units have been transferred over. 
And then if I need a value for the ending working process for this production department, I can take that same $80 cost per equivalent unit for direct materials, multiply that by the 225 uh, equivalent units production right here, and then add to that my $60 cost per equivalent unit times the equivalent units of work done up here, 135 and then that will give me a total of 26100 Now, I had the cost added in total cost to account for was cost added throughout the throughout this month and then when I add these up and I all did do it by total and then by direct materials and conversion cost by each of the two category uh, cost categories and I'll come up with the total cost here total cost to account for is step three step four cost per equivalent unit we're going to compute that and then step five accounting for the total cost and the numbers in step three and step five should match. If they do not, we have a problem. So how are we watching things flow? Well, we have our accounts payable going, and this is materials. We're looking at materials. Uh, how, and how do I know this? Well, because we can either go back to the book or we can figure out that when we're buying accounts, uh, uh, buying materials, we're debiting what? We're debiting materials for X amount, and then we're crediting accounts payable for this amount. Now, one thing, now normally I would expect to see a materials going and then being transferred to the working process. However, your book is making the assumption in, in, in the uh, Horngren book here, the 16th edition, is making the assumption that the materials are going straight to the production floor and not into a materials control account or not into inventory or storage first before their requisition to the production floor. So this is why you're going to see the, the T account here go. We see accounts payable control going straight to work and process inventory. That is because we're assuming that those materials are going straight in there. So if they're going straight here, they would not go the other route and go to materials control first and then go to work and process. So we're assuming here that they're going straight into work and process the time they, or the moment they come in to uh, the facility. And then we have our various accounts, our indirect materials, direct labor, indirect labor, and manufacturing overhead all going over here. And then as we accumulate costs over here in our work and process assembly, this is our first department. In fact, this is our first department. And then once these units are completed and transferred out, they are going to go to the second department. And so we're going to, uh, we're going to say this is transfer out. And you're going to have to, and this would be considered what transfer in costs. And we'll look at that in a future video. But this is the flow of goods. Materials being sent straight to the production floor. As units are completed in the assembly department, the first production or produ production process, then we'll transfer uh, th uh, those units to the second department, work and process testing. And then once these are completed, they'll be transferred to finished goods. And then remember when finished goods are sold, they are expensed off as cost of goods sold. Now, with materials going to directly to the uh, respective work and process account uh, department, we could see some X amount here of materials not used in the work in the assembly department, but used in the testing department to be added up here. So we could see that as well. Because we would expect in most, or in a lot of situations anyway, 
each department is going to have its own set of direct materials, whether it's making wood furniture or or, or uh, ketchup or something like that. We would ex ice cream. We would expect to see certain things added in different departments. So, uh, and again, your book is taking the uh, uh, approach that materials are being that whatever materials come in, they're going directly to their respective uh, departments, and that's why you don't see this as a materials control. You we just illustrate these as accounts payable, and then that that value is going to go into here. So this concludes this session. We will pick up with looking at case three and the weighted average method and, and uh, the first in, first out method. So um, if you are having still having some uh, conceptual difficulties with the uh, equivalent units and calculating those, please go back and rewatch this video again. Uh, before moving on because this is because computing the equivalent units is foundational because if we don't get that right we're not going to get anything else right because everything is going to be flowing down the progressive order here and if we get something wrong uh, earlier in the process of compute of computations it's going to affect everything after that so my name is Leroy Meadows thank you for joining me in this session have a good day